Paris, guaranteed income or cash transfer programs have often been framed as resources to help pay for unexpected medical bills or rent. But now, a group of doctors are pitching the program as not only an anti-poverty strategy, but an anti-violence strategy. They argue that implementing these programs could actually reduce different forms of violence in the city. Here to explain their take are Dr. Tanya Zacherson, a professor of surgery and director of critical trauma research at UChicago Medicine, Dr. Eric Reinhardt, a resident physician at Northwestern University and an anthropologist and psychoanalyst at Harvard University, and Dr. Leah Hofer, a general surgery resident at UChicago Medicine. Doctors, thanks to you all for joining us. Uh, Tanya Zacherson, let's start with you, please. How has your work in the trauma center led you to this conclusion uh, that cash transfers or guaranteed income are an effective anti-violence tool? Well, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, every day and every night uh, at the University of Chicago in the trauma bay, we see people affected by firearm violence. And interestingly, this, this is the number one mechanism of injury that we see at our trauma center, which is unusual compared to others. But we see people that come in not because of accidental gunshot wound, this is intentional interpersonal harm. And a lot of this is related to survival uh, economy, the survival economy where people are really living on the edge day to day in these neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago that have this legacy of, of economic marginalization from, we know from structural racism, redlining and such things. And we see how that harms people because they come in shot because they don't have access to what they need to fulfill their human potential, to fulfill a life with dignity. And so what happens is you see how economic inequality has a role to play in the direct violence that we see every day. And so if we can engage in cash transfers, a guaranteed income of sorts, as is being proposed by our mayor, I can see that how that might actually support our patients, it might support our families, to the sense that they're not struggling every day to survive, just and, to get by day to day. And to that point, I want to bring in uh, some of your colleagues, Dr. Eric Reinhardt. You know, how do these um, the guaranteed basic income or cash transfer programs? How might they work to address um, the the relationship between inequality and, and violence? Yeah, I think it's important to note that this is not a hypothetical connection. Inequality and violence are very closely connected, and there is a vast array of empirical research for decades that demonstrates this time and time again. And there's also a robust body of literature, less in the United States because our politicians have not been bold enough to actually roll out programs of support like this so that we'd be able to measure their effects, but from other parts of the world, in Brazil, in Mexico, and many other nations actually, that show that guaranteed income programs, like the Bolsa Familia program in Brazil, for example, significantly reduce interpersonal violence. They reduce homicide rates, they reduce sexual assault rates, they reduce um, domestic violence rates. Why? Why does this happen? I mean, as Tanya was just saying, part of it has to do with kind of survival economics, the desperation that comes from poverty, which doesn't just lead one to rational actions to try to generate income on inf in informal markets, for example, but also to psychic distress, social distress that then produces irrational actions that people don't actually want to be engaged in. I'm a psychiatrist. I see patients every single day who are engaged in violence, either as victims or as perpetrators, and often both. And they don't want to be involved in these things. But their own capacity to regulate their life is severely limited by economic marginalization. If you can support people, give them the resources to enable them to pursue the kinds of lives that they actually want to pursue, rather than continually to marginalize them through, marginalize and dispossess them through uh, policing systems and punishment systems, for example, then you see very different things manifest in social reality. So, so I think, hmm, Well, you just mentioned, you know, a, a bit about policing. I want to get Leah Hofer in here. Uh, give us a sense of, you know, how does the concept of, of public safety need to be redefined? Well, kind of our take is that um, public safety, as we know it today, isn't truly making people safe, and it's not truly including the whole public. Um, Safety means having safe, affordable housing, access to clean water and good food, access to education and employment opportunities. Um, and that's not how it's functioning today. Um, the, the policing system takes people out of their communities, incarcerates them for years, prevents them from developing wealth, from 
developing, you know, economic capital um, from putting back into their communities. And that's what we want to focus on is that safety means building communities up over time and all communities um, throughout our city, throughout our nation and around the world. Tanya Zacherson, what issues do you have with with violence prevention initiatives that focus just on individual people versus larger structural issues? That is an excellent question. So while there are some violence intervention programs that might be helpful with individual issues, taking the stance that the individual is the one with the problem and I just need to tweak that person's problems and try to mitigate or reduce their uh, or change their behavior, the way they view um, their their uh, situation. That's kind of like me going up to my trauma patient who's been shot and saying, let me give you some tools to help you cope with structural racism. That doesn't fly anymore. And we know that doesn't fly anymore. So I can give some resources for some, some jobs and supports. And don't get me wrong, that that's helpful today and tonight for that patient and their family. But if I wanna look at the causes of the causes, and address why this person is getting shot in the first place and have a proactive approach to violence prevention, I have to look at these upstream political determinants of health. Um, Eric Reinhardt, talk about the need not just to have this program, but robust social services as well, right? Because you can give, for example, a $500 cash payment to a family a month, but the price of things for them is the same as it is for everyone else. Right. It's easy to imagine that guaranteed income could be pitched as a replacement for investments in public systems in the American political context, where you have a lot of political actors who want to withdraw public support from public systems and just enable corporate entities to make profit off the basic essentials of life. For that reason, it's really important to emphasize that cash transfer programs, income programs for people be coupled with market regulation, with investment in strong public systems. Because as you say, if you give somebody $500, but you're not regulating the cost of housing and the cost of their housing increases by several hundred dollars, you've negated the benefit that you have used public resources to try to give somebody. So it's very important that cash transfer programs not be seen as a cure-all, but be seen as a supplement to broader investments in strong public systems that ensure people have universal access to healthcare, uh, access to dignified employment that is meaningful to people that they wish to pursue, um, and that they have safe neighborhoods that are that that result from uh, investments in infrastructure. You know, we need clean streets. We need you know, there's data that shows that just planting trees reduces violence. These kinds of investments in public spaces are really important alongside guaranteed income. And before we run out of time, Leah Hofer, uh, you know, do you all foresee any problems with Mayor Lightfoot's gang asset forfeiture uh, if it's approved by city council? Absolutely. You know, I think for a number of reasons. One is that um, this ordinance is built upon the premise that these gangs are massive organizations headed by some monolithic kingpin with all these resources to take away. It's not clear that that's actually true. Um, you know, uh, anthropologists and sociologists would tell us that you know, today's quote unquote gangs are just groups of young men in Chicago, um, you know, working, working together, spending time together. Um, and additionally, this ordinance, all it does uh, is take away from these communities. Again, it's, it's only goal is to take resources away to seize them. Um, and like we are saying, we really need to be investing into these communities, investing in both um, individuals, but also uh, the communities and infrastructure at large, if we really want to make lasting change and actually make an impact on reducing violence. Okay. And of course, uh, we know that uh, Chicago is beginning to take applications for its program uh, beginning in April. So we will continue to follow this program for now. My thanks to doctors Eric Reinhardt, uh, Tanya Zacherson, and Leah Hofer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.